Yeah, I, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, pressing on, so it fits, you know what I mean? Uh, if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, that's where we're going to be. And uh, we're going to be ending our final series uh, in the, in the five-week sermon series that we've been doing about finding healing. And today we're going to be talking about finding healing from our past. Finding healing from our past. And I think Philippians chapter 3 sets us up for one of the best ways to find healing from our past. Um, but before we get to that, um, has anybody ever seen Meet the Robinsons? It's like one of my favorite shows. I know, it's a cartoon type of show. Nobody? Yeah, Meet the Robinsons. Of course, you've got kids, right? Meet the Robinsons is awesome. He's got that spiky blonde hair, uh, really cool. He's an innovator. Um, he's a little dude that just wants to create stuff. And one of the, one of the themes, the theme of the movie is keep pressing forward. You make mistakes, life happens, but keep pressing forward. Um, he had the, this, the, the character, the main character, uh, Louis, I think was his name, Louis. He had the misfortune, uh, he was abandoned by his family. His mom dropped him off at an orphanage. He had mistakes in his failed inventions. Uh, he was hated for his future success, right? He was persecuted. Uh, he developed an enemy. It's the main antagonist in the story. And basically, he's trying to prevent Lewis from becoming a popular, you know, world-renowned scientist who creates a lot of stuff. And he also was egocentric. He was self-centered in a negative way. He really looked down upon himself for his mistakes and for his failures. And those are the four things that we're going to look at this morning. And so in Philippians chapter 3, it comes to the conclusion where, where Paul was writing to the church about external conflicts. Chapters 1 and 2, he's dealing with internal conflicts within the church, right? These internal conflicts cause us to lose our joy, they steal our happiness, they get our focus off of Jesus, and they can really um, be detrimental to our faith, to our belief in Jesus, and so chapters 1 and 2 deals with that, but then in chapter 3, he starts focusing more on external things outside of the function in the church. And the answer for healing is the same. It is focusing on Jesus. And Paul, actually, he's writing, it's funny, because um, you would think if you were living a miserable life, really you wouldn't have a whole lot of good things to say. You wouldn't be able to focus on healing from your past, but yet Paul is writing to, the, um, to Philippi, that's not, not the Philippines, okay, not Southeast Asia, but he's writing to Philippi, and he's writing in jail. I mean, he's had a really tough life, and Paul was in prison, and he's writing to the church, and he wants to give them some encouragement, and he really kind of deals with two things. Number one, he deals with false doctrine, right, false doctrine that steals your joy, and then number two, he kind of looks at persecution, and he gives some personal testimony from this certain perspective. So we're going to look at four things that we need to press on from this morning. The highlight of, of chapter 3 is in verse 14. It's the highlight of the chapter. Very popular verse. And if you'll look with me, this is what it says. Paul says, I press on to the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. What is Paul's answer for dealing with the pain of the past? He says, I press on. I keep moving forward. The first thing that I think that we need to press on from is martyrdom, right? Martyrdom comes from, or martyr, comes from the Greek word martus. It means this, to be an eyewitness to the point of death. For someone to be a martyr in the classical sense, it simply meant that these first apostles would give testimony about Jesus until they died. Uh, they were persecuted to the point of death for their faith. But it's the principle that we're going to kind of look at first, and that is persecution. It's where we get this idea of persecution, right? Physical pain, but not just physical pain. We can all be persecuted in our families, at our jobs, for belief in Jesus, and it can be more of a doctrinal or a, a teaching issue, a, a precept of the mind rather than a pain to the body. We can face doctrinal persecution. And in fact, I think that's probably what we struggle with the most in America. We don't really get into the nitty-gritty of persecution like they do in China or in the Middle East um, or even in points of, of Africa. What we deal with the most is a persecution of doctrine, a persecution of ideas. We get called names. We get slandered as Christians. We look bad because a lot of people who claim to follow Christ really kind of give Christians a bad name. And so Paul opens up in Philippians chapter uh, 3, verses 1, and he's writing to them, and he says this, Whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. 
I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. He's writing this um, to encourage them to rejoice in the Lord and to safeguard their faith. This word safeguard means firm foundation, to be reliable, um, solid footing, built upon what does not totter. It comes from the Greek word asphales, and it really, it really, I want you to picture like asphalt, something that has been rolled over and pressed down so much, it's not going to crack, it's not going to shift, um, that road isn't going anywhere. And so that's why Paul is writing to them, is because he wants their faith to be firm, to be founded, especially in the face of um, persecution. And in verse 2 he says, watch out for those dogs. Man, what a meanie pants. You know what I mean? Paul calling people a dog. That's kind of messed up. Yeah, one person got it. They laughed. It's okay. Those, he says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators. This is a really powerful word because in the Greek, it means rotten. It means inwardly and morally foul. It means poisonous. It is somebody who causes injuries to other people on a, an emotional or physical level. Watch out for those rotten people, and look what they're doing, who says you must be circumcised in order to be saved. Verse 3, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in the human effort. And this idea of martyrdom or persecution, Paul wants us to make a shift. How do we find healing from being persecuted for our faith or judged or criticized for what we believe? Well, the first thing that Paul does is he says, you've got to press on from a false focus. You are focusing on what is taking place now here in the flesh. And Paul says, I want you to focus on joy. Joy that you just don't have from life. But he says, joy in the Lord. Joy is like an umbrella. Right? Our joy in the Lord is like an umbrella that protects us from false doctrines and false teachings and bad personalities. Because think about it like this. If you lose your joy in Christ, if you lose your joy as being a follower of Jesus, all of a sudden you're going to start seeking out for happiness in other places. Maybe the warm and love, maybe the warm love of another person, maybe the bottom of a bottle, maybe a joint, maybe cigarettes, maybe tobacco. Um, maybe online pornography, and maybe false doctrines. Maybe you're going to go to a church that doesn't teach the truth because you're focusing on the wrong thing. And so we've got to get our focus off of the earthly things and focus on our joy in Christ Jesus. Secondly, he says, press on from false doctrine. He calls these people who teach these things, he calls them dogs and evildoers. He says that they're rotten on the inside. The context was simply this, the Jews were teaching, the Christians, you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You see, the Jews had a misconception. The Jews thought that you were saved by the color of your skin, you were saved by your race, is what the Jews were teaching. So in order to become a Jew, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to look like us. And Paul says, it is totally the opposite. The ones who are truly following God, the true circumcision, are the ones who have placed their faith in Jesus. So we can't get wrapped up in thinking that if we can just do things, we will be saved. If I can just keep up all the church attendance, if I can come on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, small group, as long as I do these things and read my Bible every day, I will be saved. Well, what happens when you miss a week? What happens if you get sick? Uh, what happens if it snows? Do you see the difference? We have to have the right type of faith. We can't focus on this idea that we're saved by works because it's simply not true. We are saved by our faith in Jesus in baptism, and that is what God wants us to believe. And so Paul was asking them, do not dwell and focus on this persecution of ideas. And there are a lot of ideas that Christians are persecuted for today. I mean, we could just list, we could list a bunch. The hot topics are homosexuality, abortion, money. I mean, those are, those are some of the things that a lot of Christians get persecuted for, their ideas. But I don't know what you struggle with or what you're persecuted for or what you're dealing with, but God wants you to have healing from those experiences in the past by pressing on in the future. I think third of all, um, he wants us to press on from a false sense of security. He says, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us, not on ourselves. We rely on our salvation based off of what Jesus has done for us. And I am so glad because I mess up. 
I make mistakes, I disappoint myself and the people around me, and if I relied upon myself, my own works for salvation, I am in trouble and you are in big trouble because we cannot be saved by the works that we do. We must rely on the grace of Jesus. And so really this first point that we're looking at, how to receive healing from pressing on, from persecution, is that in order to press on, the key phrase is this, in order to press on from martyrdom, we must marvel at eternity. That's what Paul says. Stop looking at what's going on here and start looking and thinking about what's going to go on in the future glory. He's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 8, and he deals with this idea of doctrinal persecution, a persecution of ideas. And, and look what he says here. should be up on the screen for you. He says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they will chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. How do we press on for martyrdom? Don't fear it. He says, work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near, and I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. You see, marveling at eternity was not just for the apostles. And Paul went through some heavy persecution. Paul actually, we're going to see, Paul persecuted a lot of people. And this guy was put through a lot. And the single thing that carried him through those difficult moments of his faith was that he had his mind focused on Jesus, focused on eternity. You know, one of my favorite songs that we actually sang um, last, last week, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I personally like uh, hymns, I also like hymns redone and modernized and new. I think it's a really cool opportunity to experience God from these new artists in a different way, a meaningful way to the relevant culture. And in this Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, it was written hundreds of years ago, right? And the main course is this, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full, and look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Helen Limmel, in the uh, 1800s, she wrote this hymn. She was a talented soloist. She was a music teacher at the uh, Moody Bible Institute. And she was a music critic for the Seattle Post. And she was inspired by an author, an author by the name of Mrs. Trotter. And Mrs. Trotter was extremely talented. She had a lot of different um, talents and abilities. She was a very wealthy person. Um, she, was, she was an artist. But yet she had this deep love for missions. Even though she taught music. She had a deep love for missions. And Helen, who wrote the song, inspired by Lillian, uh, or Lilius Trotter, Helen was inspired to become a missionary. And so she left the music, she left the art, she left the glory, and she decided to be a missionary to Algeria for 38 years, witnessing and evangelizing to the Muslim community. And I think this is a really cool thing. And this is the, this is the piece of work that Miss um, Trotter wrote to inspire Helen to write this. Miss Trotter wrote this in her life. Never has it been so easy to live in a half dozen harmless worlds at once. Art, music, social science, games, motoring, the following of some profession, and so on. And between them, we run the risk of drifting about, the good hiding the best. It is easy to find out whether our lives are focused, and if so, what is the focus of our lives? Where do our thoughts settle when consciousness comes back in the morning? Where do they swing back when the pressure is off during the day? She says, dare to have it out with God and ask him to show you whether or not all is focused on Christ and on his glory. She writes, turn your soul's vision to Jesus and look and look at him and a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. There are a lot of people who deal with, with doctrinal persecution and physical persecution, 
and the single thing, and one day you might be there. Maybe you are there now. One day you might be there. And the single thing that carries you through is focusing on Jesus. The second thing that Paul, that Paul deals with, if you turn back to Philippians chapter 3, as he says, I have, how do I find healing from the past? I've got to press on from myself. I've got to press on from myself. My selfishness, my egocentricness, my self-centeredness, being self-absorbed. It is the failure to see yourself, right, as nothing without Jesus. You have your own identity, your own personality, when we were at CIY, which is uh, Christ and Youth Week camp in Salisbury, Maryland, sometimes they have great speakers and sometimes they get some duds, right? And this guy came in and he was telling the teenagers everything that they wanted to hear. It's okay to swear and use foul language. Um, it doesn't matter kind of where you come from, many paths to one God. You don't really need to have the truth. And he says, you have so much more to you than Jesus Christ. Your identity, yes, your identity is so much more than Jesus. It's not just about your religion and what you believe. And of course, naturally, you know, I'm not just going to sit back and not talk about it. So I went to the leadership and I told them we'll never come back to CIY if this type of false doctrine and this bad philosophy is what's going to be taught to our kids. But this is, this is the problem. Selfishness, being focused on self and your identity outside of Jesus, it is the foundation for every sin. It really is. It's the foundation for legalism taking the scriptures farther than what they were meant to go or making a liberty, a choice, a preference law and telling other people they must conform. That's what it means to be legalistic. And we can do this with a lot of things. We can move from liberty to legalism and law really easily on things like music preference, alcohol, various foods and dieting, various um, clothing, traditions, dress apparel, it is very easy to fall into this idea of focusing on ourselves, And I think probably, you know, one of the most disappointing things that I've experienced in my, my walk with Christianity is how sometimes those who have been in the church the longest can become the most self-centered. Well, this is what I want. This is what I think is best. This is what I think the church should do. And what Paul is writing here is he is saying we have got to get our focus off of ourself and we've got to put our focus on Jesus. We will find healing from pressing on from ourselves. And if you'll read with me in Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 4. He says, we put no confidence in human effort in verse 3. And then he says in verse 4, he says, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a real Hebrew, if ever there was one. He says, I was a member of the Pharisees, which was the elite school of the day, who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I kept the law, was what he said, without fault. I once thought these things were valuable. This is what's so cool. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ as Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I may gain Christ. You could say Paul was a five-star athlete. He was put on the publishing page of Time magazine he was the number one most desired CEO. He was the best businessman of America. He was first in his class. He was the number one video gamer in the world. And he had all the scholarships and all the, all the money, all the signed deals. He was the fastest growing businessman. I mean, if anyone could boast about being a follower of God, about being number one in life, it was Paul. If anyone could boast, it was Paul. Jesus called these distractions. He called them thorns and thistles in Matthew chapter 13. He says, when the word of God is spoken and planted into your heart, these thorns and thistles come up and they choke out God's word. They get in the way of keeping your focus and your eyes on Jesus. And I want you to think about yourself for a second. What are those distractions that are keeping you from Christ? Relationships? Your job? Maybe members of your family? What is it? What is it? What type of achievements? What type of social status? What type of dress code? What type of accomplishments in the past? What type of future hope do you have? 
Money, greed, what is it that is keeping you from focusing on Jesus? You see, Paul had everything there was to have in life, and he threw it all away for the sake of following God. He says, I've got to get my mind off of myself. Paul knew that he was replaceable in the kingdom of God. It was a privilege to be called an apostle, and Paul knew that. In fact, when Paul looked at his work, even to this point, right, when Paul was an apostle working for Jesus, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there was this argument that rose up in the church at Corinth, and somebody said, well, you know what? I'm extra special because Paul baptized me. And another person said, no, I'm extra special because Apollos baptized me. And Paul comes along in verse 7, and he says, I don't matter. He says, the person who waters, um, or the person who, who plants the seed isn't important. The person who waters the seed isn't important. What's important is that God brings the increase. And it is a subtle shift, isn't it? Right? Of course, our Christian work is important. But Paul was so fixed on the eyes of Jesus, on the face of Jesus, that everything that he did paled in comparison. It didn't even rival it. What is your identity? What defines you? When you say, well, this is who I am, this is what I do, what pops up into your mind? Jesus must be a central character to that story, right? In verses 7 and 8, he basically says, I press on from trash to treasure. He says, I have discarded everything, my achievements, my social status. What are you willing to throw away for God? Are you willing to throw away some traditions or some preferences? Are you willing to throw away some relationships? Are you willing to throw away some money, some future vision? What are you willing to throw away for God? You see, the only way that we can really find healing from the past is if we press on from myself to my motive for becoming more like Jesus. We have to have at the central part of who we are, Paul says, in order to find true healing, our motive has to be, I want to follow Jesus and him alone. That has to be the center of who we are. But before we can press on from ourselves sometimes, we've got to take a step back and we've got to press on what our next point is, is from our mistakes. Now, I've made my, sh- my fair share of mistakes in life. There's no doubt about it, man. I make mistakes all the time. It's ridiculous. Sometimes I'm just like, why can't I just be perfect? Do you ever feel like that? Why can't life just be good and I'll just be perfect? And one thing that I thought about this week is I could specifically, I don't know, having my baby Piper has really resurged all these crazy memories for myself as a child. And um, one of those memories this week is I remember we had a family outing. My mom was married to my stepdad and he had three children. And then it was me and my sister. And we decided to go walking through a park. And it was a national park that we had to travel to. And uh, we're walking and we're climbing and it's a good time, you know, fun just hanging out, walking with each other. And there was this, we came to this part, there was this waterfall. It wasn't a massive, massive waterfall, but it was was probably about as long as this stage. And water was just kind of trickling off of it so that you could get under and you can have fun. And we, we were like, waterfall, you know, just like a crazy person. And so we ran over and we were playing in the puddles and we were, you know, getting underneath the water. But the thing is, is we had like jean shorts and t shirts on. We really didn't have the gear in order to get wet and when you're out in the heat and you're soaking wet and your body starts to you know get weird and chafe between your legs and you're hot and sweaty yeah you guys know what I'm talking about right you're like you're you're walking like this you're like I don't want to do this anymore you know what I mean and you're in so much pain and so we were cold it was hot out but we were cold and we were wet and so I I, this is ridiculous I remember being the one I was like oh look at that warm dry sand let's go roll in it so I ran over and I started rolling. I was like, oh, this is so warm. This is so much better. And I was like, guys, come over here and do this. And of course, like children, right, they follow. Um, and so we're all rolling in the sand and we get all, you know, warm and we feel much better. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, right? We get up. We have just compounded the issue. It is a massive mistake. I mean, sand is everywhere. We're crying. We're whining. And my parents, they really didn't care. They were like, look, you made your own mistake. You're just going to have to live with it. <laughs> right? So we had to walk all the way back to the car. We didn't have a change of clothes. I mean, it was just a terrible mistake. And sometimes you have to press on from your mistakes. And yes, that is a funny mistake, right? I mean, you know, your kids, whatever. But there are some legitimate mistakes that we hold on to after the cross. We come to Jesus, we're ready to be saved, and yet we pull all of that baggage from the past with us, and we hold on to them. And it changes us, it shapes us, In verse 6, Paul mentions one of his mistakes. He says, I was so zealous for God, for Judaism, that I persecuted the church. There's some other scriptures up up here for you that we're not going to read, but just for reference point, Paul threw people in prison that led to death. 
He oversaw the stoning of Stephen, right? I mean, think about that. Think about somebody being up right here and all of us watching. People throw rocks at them until they die. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty brutal. Paul, who was Saul at the time, oversaw that. Three times, two times he mentions in Scripture um, that I'm the least of the apostles because I persecuted God's church. He says in Galatians 1.13, he says, I violently persecuted God's church and I did my best to destroy it. You want to talk about bringing some baggage in from your past. Paul had a lot of regret. And I think if we were all to be honest with ourselves, we all probably have some regret that we have brought into our relationship with Jesus. And the question that we're asking is what wounds are still open from the mistakes of your past? What is holding you back from living in the forgiveness of God's grace? You see, mistakes are inevitable. We all will make mistakes, but there is a dynamic difference between remembering your mistakes and being humble and clinging on to your mistakes and being immobile. Remembering your mistakes gives you humility when you witness and minister to other people. Look, I have messed up too. We are saved by God's grace. But being immobile means that you cannot share the good news with other people because you're clinging on to those mistakes. Your relationships can't be healthy because you're clinging on to those mistakes. And sometimes it is really easy to cling on to the mistakes of other people, people that have hurt us. But in order to find healing from our mistakes of our past, we must press on from those things. And that's exactly what Paul says. Look what he says here in verse 9. He says, I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Not on works of the law, not on your mistakes, but on faith. He says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him and share in his death so that I, one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And focus in on this. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Paul says, look, I'm going to continue to make mistakes. But, he says, I press on. I press on to the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. You see, we have to not only have our motive right for wanting to follow Jesus, but we have to have real effort. If we are really going to find healing from the mistakes of our past, we have to make a conscious effort not to repeat those same mistakes again. I mean, can you imagine Paul persecuting the church, becoming a Christian, and then still persecuting the church? That's an oxymoron. Can you imagine a Christian committing adultery, becoming a Christian, and then committing adultery? Or fornicating, having sex before marriage, becoming a Christian, and then still having sex before marriage? Or stealing, or lying, or gossiping, or slandering, or causing division, or making legalistic statements and ideas, or hurting people? I mean, can you imagine a Christian who practiced these mistakes, became a Christian, and then willfully practiced them again? I mean, that's ridiculous, or so we think. We have to make a conscious effort to be aware of our mistakes. Let that humble us, but not immobilize us to where we're not effective for Jesus. Paul says, I've got a lot of baggage. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I am pressing on. And so here's our next key phrase, is that I will press on from my past mistakes to maturing as a Christian. That's what Paul said. I'm not perfect. Look, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We haven't already achieved uh, perfection, but Paul says, I desperately desire, I crave, I yearn to be perfect in Christ. I want to do the right thing. I want to be who God made me to be. I want to be the person that God sees me as perfect and holy, and I'm going to do everything I can to make up for the mistakes of my past, but the past mistakes are going to stay there. I'm not dragging them in to who I am now and the relationships that I have. You know, the the thing about mistakes is that we can control these things, right? We can control mistakes, but the fourth thing that we need to press on from in order to find healing from the past is misfortunes. Now, the thing with mistakes is they're under our control. We can control the mistakes that we make, but we can't always control our misfortunes, right? Our misfortunes are simply this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and it's just paraphrasing here because it's it's a really long passage. We don't have the time to read the whole thing. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul talks about his misfortunes, things that were out of his control. He says, we've been beaten, we've been put in prison, faced angry mobs, 
worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, gone without food, despised, slandered, called imposters, ignored, lived close to death, beaten, we've had aching hearts, we've been poor, and we have given up everything. We own nothing. You want to talk about a misfortune. I mean, those things are misfortunes. And my personal testimony, you guys have heard some of my sermons, you know what I've been through. You know what I've been through. You've heard some of my stories. And, you know, I was raised in a divorced home. I was sexually abused as a child. I've had broken hearts, extreme sadness, thoughts of suicide, teenage friends passed away in high school, family fights, destroyed relationships. I've been financially strained. I've been accused of false things, slandered, mocked, underpaid, overworked, terrible neighbors, sleepless nights, disappointments, failures, and the list can go on and on and on. But what we have to remember is that if we're going to find healing from those things, we must leave them in the past and press on from them to use them. And look what Paul says here. He talks about his weaknesses in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And read along with me, verses 7 through 10. He says, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, a lot of people have debated over what this thorn in the flesh is. Some believe that it's actually a, a, a kind of like a paraphrase or a statement um, or a reference to like an internal spiritual issue. Um, Paul writes in Romans chapter, I think it's Romans chapter 9, um, he talks about uh, lusting after things that his neighbor has. It's possible that Paul struggled with lust. I, we don't really know for sure. We know that Paul was unmarried. Other people believe that it was Paul's eyes that he was talking about, that Paul actually may have fought in a ring at Ephesus, may have fought a, an animal of some kind and, and lived and, and won. Um, you know, one of the, one of the rings that they, they, would, they would have for amusement. And so his eyesight started to go bad, and so he had to start writing with large letters, and he had to have other people write for him at certain times. But whatever that is, Paul says, I have asked God three times. I begged God three times for the Lord to take it away. Now, have you ever begged God for something? Like, God, please, just don't let this happen. God, please, take this away from me. God, please bring healing to this situation. I remember praying in school, God, I did not study. Please help me remember. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, I'm so desperate, but I'm so tired. There are a lot of things that are, we that are weaknesses that we have. And a lot of those things come from our mistakes and our misfortunes and our self-centeredness and our, our, our egos. But here's the interesting thing, is that in verse 9, Jesus responded to Paul. Paul had a communication with God that we don't have today. Jesus said, my grace is all that you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The final point that we're looking at is that I will press on from my misfortunes to my message. Grace is sufficient. If we want to have healing from our past, we have to be overwhelmed by the grace of God. Grace is sufficient. So Paul ends Philippians chapter 3 with this. Not really the whole chapter, but it's where we're ending. But I focus, he says in verse 13, on one thing. A lot of times we need to make sermons simple. I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I press on. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what struggles or misfortunes or mistakes that you have had. I don't know what you struggle with in your own selfishness or ego or self-centeredness. We all do that. But we must make the resolve. True healing comes with a determination to press on. Maybe you've got someone in your life that's pulling you back into those mistakes, reminding you of it, and that's part of the territory. But we've got to have the resolve. I press on. I cling to Jesus. You know, when the World Trade Centers crashed, I was, uh, I can remember, everybody remember where they were, for those of you who know? You remember where you were? 
World Trade Center's crash, and I was in the eighth grade walking down the hall, and I remember Matt Hagen, right, he, we played football together, he, he said, dude, the World Trade Center's just got hit. And I had no clue what the World Trade Centers were, so I walked straight down the hall to English class, and um, we, we were sitting there on TV, and we were watching it, and we watched, um, you know, as the towers fell. And I remember a few years later watching a movie about a couple, um, I think there were a couple police officers going in to rescue people from the towers being attacked, and the towers fell down, and basically the whole movie was about them surviving under the pressure and the weight and the torment of being stuck. They were immobilized. And I remember reading this story um, about uh, Janelle McMillan. She was a lady who was buried in the World Trade Center when they were attacked in 2001. Um, And she said, everything kept coming down harder and harder. And I just kept my head down. and And I know how I ended up the way, I don't know how I ended up the way that I was. She says, but I don't even know how I I got there. I just remembering a wall go out, and I flew, and I fell, and the rubble just kept coming down. She said it was complete darkness. She said, I heard a man's voice, help, 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 and then silence. And then the building shook again, and more debris fell. And she she says, "I I thought I was going to go down, but I didn't. I stayed right where I was. And then the shaking stopped, and the silence began. She says, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move, I couldn't get the rubble off, everything was just heavy. I couldn't see a thing, there was nothing else for me to do. And she says she believes that she fell asleep. She had a watch that was lit up and she could not, it was so dark, she could not even see the watch on her, on her wrist that was there. She says, I reached back and I could feel something soft and I realized that it was a body. Somebody had died right behind her. And she says, I slept for an hour or so and then she heard a noise and she awoke. And the pattern continued for hours. I mean, it took them hours to rescue people. And she was there, the pattern of falling asleep, something shaking, waking up. She says it was then she started to think about her life. She woke up. She started to think about it. She said she started to talk with God. She had been raised as a Roman Catholic in Trinidad. But after coming to the United States in 1998, she put religion on the shelf. She says, I was into the glitz, into the glamour. And in the rubble, my thoughts turned to God. And I knew that this building consisted of 110 stories, and I knew that no one was going to find me under 90-something floors. She just remembers telling herself, I was prepared to close my eyes and pray that I don't have to suffer under this rubble. And then the end of the article ends with this. She says, I thought about my daughter, Kimberly. She was 12. And she says, I was just seeing my daughter's face. Well, she was rescued. She was found. She could hear the whistles. In fact, there was a fireman, a uh, firefighter that died right beside her. I was wearing reflective gear. The reason why they got to her is because they saw that reflective gear, pulled it off, and they were able to pull her out. But the one thing that kept her going was seeing the face of her daughter talking with her God. And that's really what brings ultimate healing from our past. When we look and turn our eyes upon Jesus, he brings us healing. So this is our opportunity for invitation. If any of you decide that you want to find healing from your past, you can't make up for your mistakes, but you can be forgiven for it. This is the opportunity where we invite you to place your faith in Jesus, be immersed into the water to receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, to take your eyes off of what persecution you go through or the, the image that you have of yourself now, the mistakes that you've made, the misfortunes that you've had, to take your eyes off of those things and place your eyes on Jesus. I'm going to ask that you stand and pray. And if you want to make that decision, we're going to invite you now as we sing our song of invitation. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for the fact that you have forgiven us, you have loved us. God, I pray that we will be able to press on, Father. That when life gets tough, when mistakes are made, when misfortunes happen, when we get confused about our faith or we're persecuted, God, when we struggle with what we want or what God wants, Father, I pray that we will be able to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, that we will count everything as worthless garbage waste in comparison to knowing you. God, I pray if there is somebody here that wants to follow you, God, I pray that they will come forward, they will make the great confession. They will obey the gospel. God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for dying for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.